Hi, I'm Anoush, and on today's episode of the New Statesman podcast, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Jim Down, an intensive care doctor, to talk about the crisis in the NHS and his new book on intensive care. Thanks so much for coming into the studio, Jim. It was a great pleasure. Now, before we get into the meat of your book, I should tell our listeners that we are recording this episode in the week of the biggest round of strikes in NHS history. What's the mood at your hospital like at the moment and among your colleagues? I think we're all pretty um, unanimously supportive of, of the nurses and the ambulance workers and potentially, if it comes to it, the junior doctors. It's been highlighted by the last couple of years being so extreme, um, but... You know, I think the, we all feel that the nurses um, should be paid better for them and also for the future of, of the profession. You know, we're already, whatever is it, 40,000 short in this country, and that's only going to get worse unless we, you know, look after them, I think. And so you'd call on the government to give the pay rises that they're demanding? I, I Yes, I would. I mean, I, I'm, I appreciate it's a very easy thing to say from my position, and there's lots of consequences of that, but I think both in nursing and in Um, junior medical staff um, it's the only way we're going to keep them in the profession and and, um, you know we we now know how much we need them I think everyone knows uh, how much we need them and I think the shortages are severe there's lots of reasons for that which we uh, uh, you know we have been rehearsed a lot Um, but if you look at uh, junior doctors for, for example you know they're they're it's totally different to when I came out 20 however long ago that was they come out with a you know, hundred thousand pounds worth of debt. Um, they're they're paid poorly. Um, they they're, you know, it's years before they can think about moving on with the stage of their lives. And I think that um, many many of them think of just leaving, going to Australia, going to New Zealand, where where. Mm. Uh, life looks a lot more attractive. And so what does that mean, you know, if they don't get the pay that they're asking for and if the situation carries on getting worse, what does it mean for the future of the NHS? Is that something that concerns you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think we've seen just in the last 12 years, I mean, I look back to the new Labour years Mm. and, you know, what did we complain about in the NHS? We complained about MRSA, you know, which (laughs) is still there and yet you never hear about it now. And that's because um, at that time, waiting lists were three months, two months, um, for, for a hip replacement, you know. Um, and A&E targets, 98% would hit four-hour targets. It was a totally different uh, time. And whereas, you now, you know, we all know w- what the situation is now. And and if we don't get the staff, we that won't get better, I don't think. Mm. And the government will often say that, you know, this is down to the extraordinary circumstances of the pandemic, which, of course, you've written about and, and you, you know, worked, worked on firsthand. How much is it down to what COVID did to the NHS in terms of waiting lists? And how much is it down to longer term factors? I mean, I think it's a mixture. I, I, there's no question the pandemic was was horrendous and everything stopped. And and I, I believe rightly, you know, I... I, I um, there are bits of what the government did that I would criticise, but generally I think lockdowns were necessary, awful, but necessary. I think the move to, you know, focusing on the pandemic, particularly in that first uh, surge, was unavoidable. You know, I mean, it was, um, if you were there, it was awful. Um, it, and there was no other way to deal with it. It was new, the scale was unimaginable, and we had to focus on it. Um, I know people say it affected older people and but but you know this it took 10 years off people's lives the people who died it was huge but that's had a massive impact of course um and you know waiting lists have gone up but also if you look at the last sort of 10 12 years the the funding has not kept up with inflation and 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 i think it's been building over that time really i mean how much does it affect your area of the hospital you know these backlogs and the waiting lists and what you've just been describing it doesn't affect my work Mm. per se except for staffing on a daily basis so i suppose the biggest effect to me personally is that if we've got gaps on our junior doctor rotor or nursing um, shifts unfilled then it's much more difficult to run the day and what inevitably happens is that elective work gets cancelled so part of the intensive care is taking elective surgery you know really major surgery that needs to come to intensive care for a night or two afterwards and if we haven't got the staff to cover that that's the bit that gets delayed right because you can't not take emergencies so that's that's where we sit so that's our big sort of daily struggle is is to is to keep that flow going mm. and of course you know patients feel it the most when they come in on and on that day when they're all geared up to have their big cancer operation it's put off is 
is awful. Yes. And and is there a sort of, do you notice what the waiting lists are doing to people in terms of making them sicker? I mean, are you getting patients in who perhaps wouldn't have been in ICU if they'd been seen on time? I can't give you yeah. um, hard data on that. I, I know there was a very odd thing in the first wave where people stayed at home. Yeah. Quite a lot of people, you know, probably died at home because they didn't feel they should go to hospital either because they didn't want to burden it or because they were worried about catching COVID. So I'm sure there is a knock-on effect of that. And I think um, also, you know, if you delay surgery, if you're if you're waiting for hip replacement, you can't walk. If you wait another year, you know, the effects of not walking for a year are, are, are not good for you. You're less fit. You're less able to come through your surgery. So it definitely has an impact. Mm. And in your book, you know, there are some headline grabbing cases in your book. Alexander Litvinenko admitted to your ward the aftermath of the 7-7 terrorist attacks and a scene at a train crash where you actually go to the scene after a train has derailed. But a great deal of your work is also more of the sort of mundane struggle mm. to find beds. Mm. You know, how, how do you balance those two sort of the, the great drama, I think, that comes with ICU, but also these these features of sort of the, the system failures that you've just been running me through? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so that's, I really wanted to put that in because, you know, I think people, um, the sort of perception from TV dramas yeah. of ICU is it's about the, will they make it, won't they make it, you know, the sort of beeping monitor and yeah. and it's either all great or, or catastrophe. Um, but actually, of course, ICU, a lot of it is that daily struggle for beds. Um, and I try, really wanted to try, you know, that takes up a huge amount of, of all of our time, trying to work out what we can do, what we should do, how you should use the resource, how how things are going to develop over the day, because you're constantly balancing emergencies with electives. Then all the nuance about are we doing the right thing by this person by putting them through days and days of in, yeah. or weeks and weeks of intensive care, you know, is the burden of is the ben p potential benefit worth the burden? So, mm. you know, the, like I suppose a lot of uh, jobs, most of it is is those sort of nuanced, complex things, and then you have a sudden something like a pandemic or a train crash or a Russian spy that <laughs> it did changes the pace a bit. Yeah, and and how has the struggle for beds got worse over the course of your career? You mentioned the new labour years being easier. Yes, has, has that I mean, always it, been a part of it? I, I, it's always been there, uh, and it it and it's worse every winter, of course, mm. and that's the eternal struggle, uh, or or you know. Uh, problem. Uh, I think it's it's. I think it's got worse as um, well. There's lots of factors, aren't they? The, the popular. I'm not. You know, the population's changing, mm. uh, et cetera. So so uh, people are living longer. All those kind of things. I mean, there are some good factors as well. You know, smoking is clearly far less than it was when I. Mm. You know, when I was a junior doctor in the 90s, and so that's great and maybe if we could do the same thing with you know ultra processed foods and then that would be a huge thing so there are things going in the right direction but um i think the combination of a change in population and the reduced sort of relative funding has 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 made it worse definitely you write about the postcode lottery of, of healthcare in this country and one of your ideas is to pair up thriving hospitals with failing hospitals yes i mean i'm going to get in a lot of trouble for this <laughs> at work um it was you know, put forward as an idea a few years ago, I think maybe by Margaret Hodge. I, um, and because there is a there is a problem with the whole. So the one thing I'm I not I don't agree with with New Labour on this was this idea that you, you know um, the sort of business competitive thing. I mean, I I think there's a there's a place for that, but you have to be really careful with it because it's not a business. And um, you know, who 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 suffers if a if a place isn't doing well and isn't getting rewarded, the, the people who live there, not the, you know, not the people who work. I mean, the people who work there might get demoted or something, but the people who live there, you know, the patients suffer. Yes, yes. And there, there will always be, you know, centres of excellence that will attract people and it'll be a sort of a virtuous circle. So when we're training, we go around all the hospitals, so you see everything. Um, and, and I think, you know, maybe we should we should pair up the the ones that are struggling with ones that are uh, are thriving you know to try and eradicate that postcode lottery as much as we can and not claiming that we can have nirvana i do think that is something that, w that we could look at and what would that look like sort of sharing there are hospitals that are that are, are have taken over by other hospitals if they're failing and and you can make them one trust and then you mm -hmm. um you know if you all 
thrive or fail as one group. So then there's an incentive for the for the more successful hospital to, to ensure that the other one performs better, as it were. I, I think it would co- be complex, and I think, it, but but I think it's a it's a certainly worth a worth a look. You know, people always talk about money and reform, and I'm sure that's right. But you've got to be very careful with the reform, I think, so that you don't have un- unintended consequences. Well, that's interesting because a couple of former health secretaries, Ken Clark and Sajid Javid, have suggested that people who are higher paid at least should pay something for a GP appointment or a minor um, procedure. How do you feel about those kind of that kind of direction for reform? There's a thing about the NHS when it's when it's working well it's brilliant and I think um, there's a lot of advantages to it being um, free at the point of use and I think there's a lot of advantages to the the staff in it not being incentivized by what they do. If So if you you know compare with America where you get paid for doing a thing, yeah. Then I like the fact that we we aren't, you know, the consultant tiers are essentially is a flat thing. Mm. Everyone's um, paid to go to go and do their job, and that means that they don't have an incentive to do particular things because they'll get paid more. Um, now, there are, you could say there's a disadvantage because it, that doesn't breed efficiency and things. But but I think overall, I'd rather that than. Than the American system, I'm I'm very happy to pay for it out of taxation. I don't mind paying more tax for it. I don't think there's a problem with the free at the point of use. I get the argument that you know people shouldn't use it irresponsibly, but I really think the thing is you need to to have the money and the governance of it. You know wherever that comes from, and 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 I. I'm happy to do it through taxation, to be honest. And a bit about yourself. Um, intensive care is the section of hospital with the sickest patients, and you have to make these snap decisions that can affect people's lives so often. And you describe yourself in the book more than once, I think, as risk averse. Mm. Why did you choose that area of medicine? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It is a bit counterintuitive. The first thing is, I think medicine, uh, whatever you do, has risk. So um, I have huge respect for GPs in that they have this job of constantly assessing the risk of you know is this something serious or is it gonna is it fine Mm. and they do that whatever it is 30 times a day in a very short period of time knowing that there's that you can't get away from the fact that something could be wrong now they have safety nets and systems and bring people back but but I would find that really stressful uh, I want to, I'd want to scan everyone <laughs> from head to foot. And, uh, They'd love you. Uh, well, <laughs> yes, but the, uh, the taxpayer wouldn't. Um, <laughs> there's a time scale about that. So, uh, you know, there'll be the one that niggled in my head and I'd be thinking about it all week. Whereas uh, in intensive care and anesthesia, which I, I also do, it's, yeah. it's immediate. Um, so I can, so usually at the end of the day, I can see what the effects of what I've done. It happens in real time and that suits me well the risk thing though I I, you know I've had to I spent a lot of time trying to rationalize the risk and really only recently I mean as I talk about in the book towards the end it's only in the last couple of years that I've really sort of faced up to it and and you know sort of accepted that you can't you can't eradicate risk and you have to you have to learn to live with it yeah. And that's quite I mean I don't know if it'll make me a better doctor but it but it's, it's bizarre that it took me so long to to sort of accept it as we like. Well, it's really interesting that journey because you, you know, you write of some of your early uh, early experiences in a hospital, and you look at the ICU doctors and you think, mm. God, they're so confident, they know what they're doing, they're unflappable. You know, their word is the sort of gold standard. And you think that in time you'll become like that. You say you, you'll become confident and wiser, but actually you say you've become more risk averse and more anxious and actually your imposter syndrome has become more acute i think it's quite common actually so i went through a period of feeling sort of peaked in confidence if you like and then there's a couple of things that happen i think one is that you um as you get older you relate to patients more closely so more of them are your age your age uh and so you feel more vulnerable and the decisions you make feel more personal in a way because you you know, you put yourself in their shoes, which is a good thing in lots of ways, but also can make decisions more difficult. I think a lot of people towards the latter end of their career start to find the decisions more difficult for that for that reason. Yeah. So 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 your objectivity goes a bit um, and, and the more you've seen, the more you've been surprised. And that in some ways is, is not helpful. <laughs> I mean, it's, so so it's so it's interesting, you know, the, the more you know, the less you know in a way. Yes. Um, and it's about embracing that uncertainty that you... Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, I talk about yeah someone someone really put when I was having a bad time um, someone really put their finger on it and said well how do you deal with uncertainty and that really made me think that's what I've got to, that's the problem we all have to deal with it don't we uh, but I was I was doing that thing of um, you know Baldrick writing his <laughs> name on a bullet so he couldn't be shot so that yeah. he had the bullet with his name on it <laughs> um, and you make a really striking point in the book that anaesthetists many of whom are ICU doctors mm. like you they have a shorter life expectancy than other doctors mm. why do you think that is and why did that stat strike you that stat is a sort of you know I'm not saying that's completely hard data but there is data to, mm. to, to, to suggest that and um, the I think the it's an odd job because it um, it's got this sort of a uh, combination of high responsibility but low control. When we put someone to sleep, they're completely our responsibility and you have to take over their vital functions. And that's almost always absolutely fine. So I don't want to put off anyone off having an anaesthetic, but it's odd because you, for two reasons. One is you are not the person who makes them better, mm -hmm. but you can make them a lot worse. And two, you, you're not the one who's, who's really made the decision for them to be there. Now, with more complex patients, we do get involved in that decision more and more. But, but sort of traditionally, the surgeon books them for a case and then you take them on. And, and, and obviously, some people are very straightforward to anesthetize and others aren't. So you've got this, this gap between uh, control and responsibility. And, and people talk about that as a, as a high stress, um, a, a, a stressful thing to have. There's also this issue that the best you are at it, the more invisible you become which is an odd thing you know and that's why people become anaesthetists I think because they're not showy people but it right. is a uh, you know uh, all, we're always quoted that 50 percent of the country don't realize that they're medically you know medically trained all that kind of thing oh really so it's an odd job in that way and then the final tragic thing is that of course anaesthetists have access to drugs mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know through my career I've I've um known of a few people who've taken their own lives uh, anaesthetists and and they they do it very quietly and effectively and it's very very you know it's it's mm -hmm. awful um so it's so i think yeah it's it's a mixture of factors yes and you do write about how your own mental health has been affected by mm -hmm. your work can you talk a little bit about your experience with that yeah so i um i mean i think covid affected us all initially in that sort of you know extraordinary sort of camaraderie way everyone just came came yeah. in and got on with it uh, and in some ways, that w it was easier for us because we had a job and we, you know, was you knew what you were meant to do. Mm. But by the end of that sort of year and a bit of the first two big waves, um, we were all a bit shell shocked by the just the scale of of, uh, of what had happened, really. Yeah. Uh, and many of us were were haunted by, you know, all the patients um, we'd seen. And then, and I came out of it, and then had a had a a, a case that was upsetting, and mm -hmm. and that I, um, that just was the straw that broke the camel's back, I think, and I sort of decompensated. It felt very ac acute. It felt like it had happened just after that thing, but looking back, you know, it's clear that it was um, lots and lots of things. Yeah. Uh, and I just uh, I got into a sort of anxiety depression spiral. Um, and I had I had two lucky things, I suppose. One was that I'm a, uh, by being here, I'm a massive oversharer, so <laughs> I I didn't go, you know, I didn't shut up about it as some people do. Mm. Uh, I just I told everyone and bored everyone to death. <laughs> and uh, and and the other thing was that although I felt dreadful, I, I didn't ever not want to get better. I didn't get into that right. feeling of, you know, I don't want to, I want to sort of just stop here mm -hmm. so that so I was lucky and I was also lucky in that um had amazing support um you know at work from our from our psychological service through a thing called practitioners health which is there for um you know all all medical staff uh and then I became a cliche and started jumping in the Lido like everyone else oh yes yes <laughs> <laughs> the cold swimming I know cure. <laughs> yes, yes. But it was incredibly helpful to me because it was the first, I mean, I never dreamt I'd do it and someone suggested it. And uh, the first time I got on the water, it just completely cleared my head because I couldn't think of anything apart from the how cold I was. <laughs> <laughs> and you yeah. go all year round, don't you? Yeah, you, I still you go, yeah, five degrees this yeah. morning. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah, cold. Impressive. The thing, one of the things I like about it is it's the people there, are, it's not at all, there's no machismo or, mm -hmm. you know, they're just a bunch of, 
chili funny, men. Yeah, chili <laughs> and women. Um, but yeah, chili sort of, you know, middle to elderly men who, who talk nonsense and, and yeah. <laughs> Shiver. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because during the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about, you know, this idea of rationing healthcare. But actually, that is something that you sort of have to do every day when you decide who does and doesn't get an ICU bed. Because as you write, it's not a very nice experience being there. My personal view on this is that is that rationing is there. Mm-hmm. You know, we for rationing not to be there, we'd have to have an endless budget. Yeah. So, you know, all the time we're rationing. So if a new drug comes out, they do a, do a cost benefit analysis and decide whether to make it available on the NHS or not. I mean, that's rationing, isn't it? No one likes to talk about it. And I suppose my caveat would be we don't ration emergency care. You know, if you I think the NHS has always been and still is really brilliant if you if you acutely sick. Uh, and and I suppose that's one of the reasons I would defend it to the you know, to the Hilton, I, I would have, I'd be against, uh, on principle, against privatisation because I think picking off the easy bits and leaving that hard bit to the NHS really frightens me. The NHS is what picks up the problems from the private sector often. So, so if you things go wrong in the private sector, you know, it's very common to end up in the NHS. Not always, and I'm not having a go at the private sector, but it offers that those hard yards at the, mm-hmm. uh, and I think it's brilliant for that. But you know, if you if your um, if your hip replacement, you wait a year for you. That's rationing, isn't it? I mean, that's because yeah. you'd be better served getting it done in in a month. Mm. And if that's a form of, you know, if you've got cancer and it's delayed, that's so. So yeah, I think we have to face that. The difficult thing about that is, I mean, it'll always be there, but also the decisions we make about it are so difficult. You know, yeah. And that's what I'm trying to get at in that yeah. beds chapter is is. It seems that obvious that where you delay the person having bariatric surgery, say, but of course, then they will get all sorts of problems by being delayed and they're on a pathway. And so I don't think there are, I suppose I, the point I come out with at the end is that there are, it's not, it's not straightforward how to, how to ration it. Yeah, well, that's a really interesting part of the book that runs, it's a theme that runs through the book is the sort of the weight of those ethical decisions and how you sort of reconcile those each and every day. Yeah, or or try to. Yeah, we'll try to, yes. (laughs) (laughs) All right, well, I think that's all we want to ask but thank you so much for coming on to the podcast it was great to have you and I'm sure our listeners have learned a lot about the inner workings of these sometimes mysterious parts of the hospital <laughs> that hopefully none of us you know have yes. to use well that's I mean yeah no one really wants to know about it unless they have yes. to go there but I thought yeah well hopefully they want to read about it <laughs> yes hopefully and the yeah. book is uh, Life in the Balance and it's out on the 23rd of February thanks so much thank thanks you. for having me